that on there. This is a lecture for my second hour class on the 17th of March. They're flashing that on there, and those are East and West Germans uh, tearing down the wall, okay? And when the Berlin Wall came down, I mean, I never thought in my lifetime that the Cold War would end. I just thought there would always be a Soviet Union, it would always be the United States, and they would be locked in mortal combat. Uh, as it turns out, the Berlin Wall was the beginning, of the, the, the destruction of the Berlin Wall was the uh, beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. And by the way, you can go see four panels of the Berlin Wall right up at um, uh, Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. You can also go in the room where uh, Churchill gave the Iron Curtain speech. They've got a little Churchill Museum. It's a wonderful little college campus, uh, Westminster College, uh, five hours from where you're sitting. You can go up and you can tell on one side of the wall is clean. That was the uh, East German communist side, and it was painted white, okay, so the spotlights could zero in on people trying to escape and the guards could shoot them, but on the other side, there's all kinds of graffiti like that. Freedom of expression comes along with freedom, okay, and you can, just looking at the wall, you can see a contrast between the two systems, communism versus uh, liberty, okay, um, and that's five hours or four hours, maybe, from, from where you're sitting, up in Fulton, Missouri, just uh, I think it's just south of Columbia, which is the uh, capital of Missouri. But anyway, um, so um, by the end of 1961, then, uh, the United States seemed to be in retreat. You know, there had been the Bay of Pigs, the Castro, excuse me, Khrushchev had bullied Kennedy at the Vienna, the Berlin Wall had, uh, the Berlin Wall had been built. Uh, and again, it seemed like, you know, some people, some, some analysts would say, well, the United States is holding its own, but others would say we're in retreat and the communists are winning uh, the Cold War. And of course, uh, that certainly concerned not just Kennedy, but a lot of Americans. But Kennedy uh, had this idea because Kennedy is a tough Cold Warrior. Again, regardless of how his uh, devotees and advocates today try and paint him as some sort of liberal, he was not. He was a tough hard-nosed uh, Cold Warrior, uh, and he believed in taking the Cold War to the communists, okay? He, he didn't believe the Cold War was going to be won around the negotiating table. And his idea was this, if we are perceived as weak, and of course Kennedy's a World War II veteran, and he thinks about Neville Chamberlain, Hitler, you know, Hitler thought he could uh, take France and then uh, wheel around and destroy Russia, and England would sit over there and not do anything because he had been dealing with the Neville Chamberlains of the world. Well. Um, you know, because England, in Kennedy's view, England was perceived as weak, Hitler started World War II. And he said, Kennedy said to his cabinet, if we, the United States, if the Russians perceive us as weak, uh, they may make a move that would result in war, and the war I'm talking about will be the last war in history. It will be a war without winners. It will be the end of humanity. And so Kennedy said, we have to prove that we're tough. So the Soviets will never, so the Soviets will never even dream of challenging us. Uh, and of course, you know, he was bouncing ideas around the cabinet and he said this, and I quote, he said, now we have a problem. He said, we have the power. You know, we have the power. And he said, now we have the problem of making our power credible, showing the world that we're not a paper tiger, that we're the real deal. And he said this, and he said, and it looks like Vietnam is the place. In other words, Viet, end quote, Vietnam is the place where we can win and show the world that the United States is tough. And he secretly ordered uh, 500 Green Beret, and Green Beret are combat troops, and I, but I don't want you to write down that Kennedy ordered the first combat troops. I mean, technically he did, but the guy who sends the first combat troops that actually engage in combat is Lyndon Johnson, who succeeds Kennedy. But Kennedy said, 500 Green Beret uh, to Vietnam, more or less to scope the situation out. But of course, the problem for the, you know, get this down, the problem for the United States in 1961, so far as Vietnam was concerned, was that, that which war was, which Vietnam war was going on in 1961? The North versus the South. It was a Civil War, very good. The Third Vietnam War. And of course, you know, the United States, uh, was determined to make South Vietnam a showcase of democratic success against communism. Uh, and so we had engaged, get this down, into nation building. We just finished a war 
You know, if we had learned the lessons of Vietnam, I read one historian who said this, if we had learned the lessons of Vietnam, which we clearly did not, if we had learned the lessons of Vietnam, we would have never gone to Afghanistan. Uh, and if you look at the retreat out of Afghanistan, the whole time we were retreating out of Afghanistan and leaving millions of dollars of, of, of military hardware, the most sophisticated hardware in the world, in the hands of the Taliban, and the people we went there that we said we were going to defeat, uh, uh, they kept showing film clips of the United States leaving Vietnam when Saigon fell. Uh, the two are very, very similar, okay? Both are efforts at nation building and failed. You know, we went to Vietnam, uh, we went to Afghanistan and said, well, we're going to go get Osama bin Laden, we're going to destroy this terrorist group. And then we decided, well, we're just going to stay and make this into a democracy. Well, good luck. And that's what we were trying to do in Vietnam. And I must say that our efforts to make Vietnam a democracy, it was doomed from the very, very start. Uh, we were nation building. And I want to tell you, nation building rarely, if ever, goes well. Rarely, if ever, goes well. Um, but our efforts there were going to hell in a handbasket. We were trying to, quote, win the hearts and minds. That's a phrase always associated with the Vietnam War. We were trying to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people. We did the same thing in Iraq. We did the same thing in Afghanistan just recently. Uh, and of course, all three failed. What, what do I mean by we were trying to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people? We were providing them with medical care, hospitals, schools, improved roads, major highway systems, agriculture methods, electricity, all that we're doing while we were fighting, ended up fighting the Fifth Vietnam War. And still, we could not, our best efforts could not, we're trying to win them over to our side of the democratic ideal, and our best efforts could not win them over because Ho Chi Minh was a national hero. Ho Chi Minh had defeated the great Western power, France, that had dominated Vietnam for 200 years. There's nothing we could do to overcome his popularity. And he had a very, so, you know, we're doing all these projects where he's got a very, very simple slogan. By the way, this is why we are doomed from the minute we send combat troops in 1965 to Vietnam. We're doing all these projects. Ho Chi Minh had a very, very simple, simple slogan. Um, you know, people try and make things complex. I get letters from people all the time and they give themselves a title and it's that long. I'm the assistant secretary of the da 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 you know, you're, you're, you're half asleep by the time you get through reading the signature on the letter. These Ho Chi Minh knew that simplicity has its place, and he just said this. You know what? I, Vietnam for the Vietnamese. Wow. Vietnam for the Vietnamese. Uh, in other words, we, uh, you know, the, uh, we don't want, we didn't want France here, we, and we got rid of them, and we don't want the United States to take their place. And by the way, get this down. He said that the United, he said that the South Vietnamese government, for those people who said, "Well, South Vietnam is fighting for democracy," get this down. He said South, the South Vietnamese government is just a puppet, puppet, <coughs> excuse me, just a puppet of the West. In other words, yeah, they've got a president, yeah, they've got a national assembly, but who controls that? Who's pulling the strings? They'll do whatever the United States wants them to do, because what the United States wants to do is they want to come in and take the place of the French. And they want to exploit Vietnam like the French exploited Vietnam uh, before them, okay? Uh, and by the way, Ho Chi Minh, this, I think this is quite interesting. Uh, you know, the United States is really not even in this war yet, but when you want to know why we failed, you can't go back to 1965. Uh, when Harry Truman was president, Ho Chi Minh wrote him three letters. Uh, and those three letters were intercepted by the CIA, and they were never shown to the President of the United States, and they had just recently, I would say in the last 20 years, just recently been discovered. But these were never shown to Truman. And in those letters, Ho Chi Minh, to the President of the United States, quoted Thomas Jefferson's, all men are created equal. He quoted Woodrow Wilson, uh, and Woodrow Wilson's idea that all nations have the right to self-determination. And Ho Chi Minh said to the President, we agree. We admire the United States, this is a quote, we admire the United States, and we are asking for the help of the United States to help us create an independent nation. Those were never shown, shown to Truman. That was a golden opportunity in 1949, 1950, to avoid the tragedy that still haunts this country today, and it's the Vietnam War. I've been teaching the Vietnam War for a long time, and I'll tell you, you can walk in a classroom with students, and they may not know Ho Chi Minh from Sitting Bull. But you can say the Vietnam War, and you can just visibly see them get uncomfortable. They may not know anything about it, but it's just bad. 
There's just something we want to forget about Vietnam. Uh, we want to shake it. Uh, and of course, all of that could have been avoided. 58,000 lives saved, and then there are tens and hundreds of thousands that are wounded, and uh, we didn't have PTSD. Uh, it wasn't diagnosed then, but mental problems. They used to call it shell shock in those days. All of that could have been avoided. Perhaps, you'll never know, Truman might have read those letters and put them in the paper uh, shredder, but maybe that all could have been avoided. But those three letters, the three lost letters of America, that's what they're called, those three letters were never shown to Truman. So, uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, will successfully paint the United States as just a group of other, uh, uh, another group of Westerners taking the place of the French who want to exploit uh, Vietnam. Uh, and of course, as I've said to you before, the United States was also swimming against the tide of history, and you never want to swim against the tide of history. Uh, colonialism in the world is coming to an end at the very time that the United States does everything it can to prop up French colonialism in Vietnam after World War II. And we should have washed our hands of the matter uh, after Dien Bien Phu, uh, but we didn't. And we became the successors. That's what Ho Chi Minh called us, the successors of the French. And we want to establish a government in South Vietnam. And so what we do, and get this down, uh, you know, if you've got a government, you've got to have a president. So, and, and by the way, the United States is aware of what Ho Chi Minh is doing. There's propaganda war against the United States. The United States is saying, uh, you know, or excuse me, the, the Ho Chi Minh is saying the United States is nothing more than a group of, another group of uh, Western imperialists who are there to exploit the French, and, or the, the, the Vietnamese. And so uh, uh, take the place of the French, I meant to say. So, you know, I think you, with, with all that in play, you have to be very careful when you're going to pick a president for this brand new democracy you're trying to create. Uh, so where, you know, what, what kind of person do you want to be the president of this new South Vietnamese democracy? What are some of the qualifications he might have to have, or she, but in those days it was a he. What's the one big qualification you want him? And they'll listen to the United States. Huh? They'll listen to the United States. Well, certainly, we're not going to appoint someone that won't listen to us, but just someone that will win the loyalty or help win the loyalty of the Vietnamese people. What <laughs> must this person be? Anti-communist. Huh? Anti-communist. Certainly, we want someone anti-communist. A Vietnamese. There you go. You Vietnamese. Okay. Yeah. You know. You want a Vietnamese. If these people are saying this guy's just a puppet of the United States, you want a Vietnamese. So the CIA, get this down, found the president in New Jersey. Okay. Good choice, New Jersey. Uh, he was Vietnamese. He was studying at the uh, Mary Knoll Seminary to become a Roman Catholic priest. His name was Den Diem. Den Diem. There he is. Write him down. Den Diem. Went to New Jersey. Okay. <clears throat> He's about five foot five. There's another picture of him with the U.S. Ambassador to Vietnam, Henry Cabot Lodge. You might recall that he ran with Nixon for vice president in 1960. Um, he's 5'5". He was 60 years old. He was a chain smoker. He would literally light one cigarette off the end of another. If you had a conversation with him when you were done all around, he was you know, 50 cigarette butts. And he was an endless talker. He could not shut up. I mean, if he, you know, when the American diplomats saw him coming, they ran screaming out of the embassy unless they had three hours to just sit there. And that's what he's doing right there. And you can see that Lodge isn't saying anything. He's just looking down, and, and DM is doing all the talking. Plus, he wore Western business suits. And what was his first language that he spoke? English. What? English. No. Nope. Even worse. What? English. What? No, he didn't speak Vietnamese. That would have been a plus. If the guy had spoken, he spoke Vietnamese, but not as his first language. Which language did he speak? French. French. Okay, French. You, what do you think? Ho Chi Minh's going to do anything with that? Yeah, he spoke. He spoke French. We couldn't have made a worse choice. Plus, he was a Roman Catholic. And what are most people in 
who practice a religion in in uh, Vietnam. They're Buddhists. Yes, write that down. They're Buddhists. Okay, Buddhists. <clears throat> Devoutly Buddhist. Okay, it's like picking a Buddhist, which might do a very good job, but it would be like. Picking a Buddhist to be the president of Ireland, uh, you know, Ireland being a heavily Roman Catholic country. Anyway, uh, plus, so that's all. Oh, that's a big problem. Plus, get this down. We say we were trying to establish a democracy in South Vietnam, and DM was no Democrat. Get this down. Now, I'm not talking about Joe Biden's party. I'm talking about a lower case. You're talking about the political party. It's a capital letter. I'm not talking about that. A Democrat. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. That's my party, but I'm a Democrat. I believe in a democracy. I like Republic. I, I believe in a Republic even more, but I, I, I am a I am a Democrat, small d Democrat. DM was not. He didn't believe in democracy. But he got this down. What he believed in was power. And he shut down newspapers that criticized him. Uh, he shut down universities, schools. He had a secret police. Okay. And you could be arrested in the middle of the night. Sounds a lot more like Stalin than Thomas Jefferson. And anyone who spoke out against him or criticized him ended up in jail. In fact, by 1963, they had run out of jail space in Vietnam. And here we are saying, well, we're just here trying to create a democracy. And the jails are overflowing with, quote, political prisoners, people who just exercise the basic democratic right, which is freedom of speech and thought and expression. So the jails were overflowing. And Ho Chi Minh is saying, yeah, the United States... So, say they're trying to create a democracy. Boy, they're doing a great job down there. They say we communists are evil. The jails of Hanoi are not overflowing with prisoners. The people of this country are going about their business. But the main problem with DM, get this down, was by the time JFK became president, South Vietnam was losing the war for all the reasons I've just mentioned and some others I will mention. Ho Chi Minh, and they get this down, Ho Chi Minh, by 1961, Ho Chi Minh and the Congress were winning. And Diem had been reduced, his army isn't worth a flip. And Diem had been reduced, it's sort of like we, you know, look at all the money we, you know, there's so many analogies between Afghanistan and the war we just finished last year. The 20 year commitment and Vietnam. Uh, we spent billions and years training uh, an Afghan army to take the place of the United States when the United States left and what happened? It collapsed like a house of cards. And the same thing is going to happen here. Again, if we had learned the lessons of Vietnam, we never would have gone to Afghanistan. You know, just think about this. We said we were going to Afghanistan to get Osama bin Laden. So we sent tens of thousands of troops and thousands of them were killed and wounded. We stayed there 20 years and had to run out of that country. Did we get Osama bin Laden? Are you not aware that Osama bin Laden is not still alive? Did you miss that little tidbit of information? Hitler's dead too, by the way. Just in case, you know, yeah, yeah. Did we get Osama bin Laden? Who got him? Did the first Marines storm into his hideout and shoot him down? A group of Navy SEALs in one helicopter. Hundreds of thousands of Americans go to be a tramp all over the place, shoot it out, thousands of them get killed, and in the end, land in a helicopter. Why didn't we just land the helicopter to begin with and shoot him and get the hell out of there and save lives and money and all sorts of... You understand what I'm saying? Well, anyway, when Kennedy becomes president, um, Ho Chi Minh and the communists were winning. And, and Den Diem's army was collapsing. And so what was Den Diem begging Kennedy for? Troops. Troops. He wants Americans to come fight his war for him. If blood has to be shed, he wants it to be American blood that props up his presidency. 
He wants troops on the ground. But Timothy was hesitant. Get all this down. Timothy was hesitant. And so before committing fully to Vietnam, are you with me? Before committing fully to Vietnam, he did, and, you know, no more Bay of Pigs. He's not going to just jump into this. He called in his military advisors, and they said, oh, you know, full steam ahead. Let's go kick their tail. But before doing that, Kennedy decided to send some people over to check it out in Vietnam on the ground and see what was going on. And he picked... Uh, one civilian, and then he picked a World War II general named Maxwell Taylor, and Maxwell Taylor in World War II was known as Old Ramrod, okay? I don't think you're going to get a very objective picture of him. And they came back from Vietnam. I'm trying to think of the name of the civilian, which is not important for our part here. But they came back, and they told Kennedy what about the Vietnam War? Don't what? Go. What? Don't go there. Just the opposite. We're winning. We're winning, Mr. President. You ought to commit some troops. We'll mop that place up. I mean, how big is Vietnam? How big is it? About the size of New Jersey. You think the U.S. Army can take New Jersey? I hope so. About the size. Yeah, Mr. President, we're winning. But Nixon still, excuse me, Kennedy still wasn't convinced, and so he sent his vice president. And who's his vice president? LBJ. Lyndon Johnson, who will be the man that fully commits US, the U.S. to the Vietnam War, sends the most troops to Vietnam, opens up the American ground war to Vietnam. He sent Lyndon Johnson and said, I want your assessment. And Johnson goes over and he met with DM. Johnson's a big talker, too. He's a big Texas wheeler dealer, cowboy hat, cowboy boots. And he came back, and it just hurts the side of my tongue to say this. You know, I'll have to soak my jaw in salt water tonight when I get home, when I have to, when I say this. But when, uh, uh, Johnson went over to Vietnam and met with DM, talked to him a long, long time, came back and told Kennedy. He said, and I quote, this is what he said, Den DM is the Winston Churchill of Southeast Asia. Den DM is the Winston Churchill of Southeast Asia. End quote. Incredible. Incredible. He compared DM holding back the South Vietnamese, uh, the North Vietnamese and Ho to Churchill holding back Hitler, which there's a word for that that I can't use in this class, but there's another, it, that's insanity. That's insane. You, you, well, that's insane anyway. But Johnson said, we got to support him. And so Kennedy was relieved. Okay, Kennedy was relieved that he starts sending more advisors to Vietnam. And I want you to get this down now about the Vietnam War, because people know very, very little about it, except, you know, they watch the Vietnam War movie. Uh, liberals, leading liberals, got us involved in that war. A lot of people think, oh, it's a bunch of old hard-fisted conservatives. And by the way, they call Nixon a conservative. Nixon got us out. Despite all of his sins... You know, Lyndon Johnson got us bogged down in Vietnam so far. You know, by the time Lyndon Johnson left office, 500 Americans were dying a week every seven days in Vietnam. The Tulsa World, the day of Oklahoma, had a black box. And there was a, had a black, that's what we used to read over in my part of the state. Had a black box, and it would have Oklahoma, today's Oklahoma war dead. Almost every day there were two or three young men that had been killed in Vietnam. <clears throat> 500 a week dying, okay? Nixon got us out, despite all of Nixon's. And by the way, it wasn't very pretty the way he got us out, but he got us out of Vietnam. If you, you know, any Vietnam veteran I ever spoke with, any Vietnam veteran I ever spoke with, when you mention Lyndon Johnson, they cuss and spit on the ground. When you mention, when you mention Nixon, they say, well, he got us out of that hellhole called Vietnam. But look, who got us in? The liberals, truly. Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson. 
like I say, Nixon got us out. There's a great book, if you're interested in the Vietnam War, called The Best and the Brightest. The Best and the Brightest. And that's what it was. These are guys that had degrees in foreign policy from Georgetown and Columbia and NYU. The brightest we had. You know, they're advising these presidents, and they get us into a quagmire. I, I call Vietnam the open wound in this country that will not heal. Okay? Uh, some people say, well, the Civil War healed. Yeah, the Civil War eventually healed. When everybody remotely associated was dead and gone 50 years, it began to heal. But in some ways, we're still fighting over issues of the Civil War today, i.e. the Confederate flag and statues of Robert E. Lee and others. The Civil War has never, never, ever civil rights uh, discrimination. Civil War has never gone away. And I fear that Vietnam is, is the same. It's the same thing. You know, Dien did not get this down. Uh, he was not a good ally. And we sort of have a pension of picking bad allies. In Afghanistan, we picked a guy named Karzai. And Karzai was more interested in getting away with as much of the uh, Afghani treasury as he could. And I'm sure wherever he is, I need to look that up, he's living quite well. But he wasn't a good ally. He didn't have the loyalty of the Afghan people. Uh, in the same way with Dien. Now, the United States wanted a democracy in South Vietnam, and DM wanted power. Wanted power, okay? Uh, and throughout the Vietnam War, get this down, throughout the Vietnam War, most of the people of Vietnam, on both sides, were simply just waiting to see which side would win so they could ally themselves with the winner and get on with their lives. Vietnamese peasants were a lot more interested. This is hard, you know, to win the hearts of my... They were a lot more interested in the uh, monsoons. And monsoons, it's not a rain, by the way. <coughs> a monsoon is a wind that blows in the rain, okay? Just for the record, but monsoon, that's a word the American people weren't even uh, familiar with until the Vietnam War, and our troops wrote that. Uh, <coughs> but it didn't take the end long, though, to figure out that the United States would support anyone who was anti-communist. Uh, and that these, quote, gullible Westerners, us, would send troops and money and weapons to Vietnam. Um, and his goal becomes to get American boys to establish his power by shedding their blood, their blood. And, of course, the chief advisor of the president was Robert McNamara. We wrote him down the other day, didn't we? McNamara, Secretary of Defense. By the way, McNamara was a mathematician. You know, we train you in math. We're shutting down liberal arts schools. You don't need the poetry. You don't need history. You don't need all that garbage, uh, you know, to make money. Uh, you know, how much money is poetry ever going to make you? How much philosophy? Uh, you know, they, uh, they're, they're shutting down philosophy departments because we don't have time for philosophy. Uh, and every time I hear the state of Oklahoma talk about anything, they want to put more money into uh, math and science. And I have nothing against math and science, as I've said to you many times. If I take a pill, I don't want it to kill me. When I get on a plane, I want the thing to fly. When it gets ready to land, I want it to land. That's all math and science. And, uh, you know, miracle medicines and all, tons of kudos to that. But uh, I also will remind you that uh, today, the people who live the best in North Korea, while the population stars are mathematicians and scientists because they're creating nuclear weapons for their dictator, the people who live the best in Iran are mathematicians and scientists, some of the best, highest paid people in, in communist China, which is a dictatorship. And they want to uh, literally extend, you know, replace the United States as superpower. Our mathematicians and scientists, the people who planned the Holocaust were mathematicians and scientists. You know, you take away history and philosophy uh, and, and, and turn a bunch of uh, mathematicians and scientists together, I'll tell you what you get, you get the Holocaust. Very efficient. Oh, you know, just thinking, you know, people say, think of, think of the problem it was to plan the deaths of 15 million people, transport them to where they were going to be killed, kill them, and then destroy the evidence. That may be the greatest scientific project and mathematical pro project in all of history. Take away math and science, take, take away history and philosophy from math and science, and that's what you get. Well, McNamara, I'm not calling him not, he was a statistician, okay? He loved statistics. He was, a, he was a numbers man. And he told John Kennedy this, by every measurement we had, we're winning the war. And we weren't. We weren't. There's a, a lie that says numbers don't lie. 
Numbers don't lie. Yes, they can. They sure can. Here's an example. At the end of the Vietnam War, the United States had lost 58,000 young Americans killed in Vietnam. 58,000. How many North Vietnamese died in the, Viet in, the fifth, in the fourth Vietnam War? That's the war we're in. How many, how many Vietnamese? How many did we kill? We lost 58,000. How many did we kill? 10, how much? 10,000. 10, try 2 million. We killed 2 million. We lost 58,000. Looking at numbers, we lost 58,000. They lost 2 million. Looking at the numbers, who won that war? America. Huh? We did. Did we win that war? I'll, I often make the analogy, it's like a football. You've heard of this before, if you keep up with football. One team has more first downs, more yards. The numbers show that you won, but not the scoreboard. Numbers show that we were winning this war, but numbers don't make history. I will say it again, history is made by people. And that is something that this great statistician, statistician, that word just gives me cold chills. Statistician. I'm sure enjoying my statistics class. Oh, yeah, well, here, I've got a drill, and you can drill your foot, and that will be just as fun. But anyway, statistics. Yes, that's the thing. You know, uh, McNamara never took uh, uh, people into account. And by the way, what happens to Robert McNamara? He eventually has a nervous breakdown. And he's such a burden, his wife tries to commit suicide. And he's forced to resign. And if you watch his resignation speech, uh, he's almost coming to pieces right on national television. Uh, and then, of course, and he resigns as Secretary of Defense. And then he writes a book. It's in our library. It's pretty lousy. It's called In, in 1994. He's no longer here. He lived to be almost 100 years old. But he wrote a book called In Retrospect. And I'll just give you the short version. Of, you know, he was explaining how we got into Vietnam. Uh, here's, here's his explanation for you so you don't have to dash down and check out the book this morning. Uh, oops, made a little boo-boo. Sorry. All our numbers and statistics. Oops, sorry. What do you think that does for the... And, of course, most of them are gone now. What do you think that does for the mothers and fathers whose sons and daughters are, named, uh, are up on that wall? They got, uh, I know we live in the uh, I'm sorry generation. You know, if you just say you're sorry, everything's okay. No, it's not. It never has been and it never will be. Well, you're unforgiving. Yes, I am. But uh, no, that, that, you know, gee, I, I just didn't mean to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, everybody that they convict of a mass murder with a chainsaw, you know, you have anything to say before we sentence you? Well, I'm just so sorry I killed your daughter. I'm just. It really helps the parents. You know, they're dead. Oh well. Oh, you're so well. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, that's what McNamara essentially says. Made a little boo boo there. Made a little mistake. Sorry. Won't do it again. Yeah, yeah. That's what the retrospect is about. I want you to also get this down quickly. I've had my little vent period there. I want you to get this down quickly. Uh, we didn't go blindly into Vietnam. You hear people say, "Well, we stumbled into Vietnam." No, we didn't. I, 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 no, you know, all I have to do to prove that we didn't stumble into Vietnam, we had the French example in front of us. The French are there nine years, and they're driven out, and we'll be in Vietnam from 65. We're there eight years, and we're driven out. And so we didn't go by. But by the way, there were other warnings all the way. Other warnings all the way. Uh, for example, there was, uh, in Kennedy's cabinet, there was a man who was, not the Secretary of State, but he was the Under Secretary of State. His name was George Ball, and you don't have to write him down unless you want this information for your own. But George Ball, you know, if you ever read an extensive history of, of the Vietnam War, you'll encounter George Ball quite a bit. And he said to President Kennedy openly at a cabinet meeting while they're talking about what should we do about Vietnam, he said, Mr. President, Viet this is before we've got one combat troop on the ground, he said, Mr. President, Vietnam, Vietnam is a dead-end street. He said, Mr. President, don't stake American prestige in Vietnam. You know what he meant by that? He said, the United States has the respect and admiration of the world. Don't get involved in a little war. We, now I'm, talk, I'm translating what he said. Don't get involved in a war in a faraway third world country that we cannot win. You will damage the reputation of the United States. Don't, 
you know, if you're going to stake our reputation on something, stake it on beating Hitler. Uh, you know, at least if we had lost World War II, uh, the consensus would have been, well, it was a noble effort to end the great evil. But to go to Vietnam, this third world country, this massive United States, and if we don't win that war, our reputation will be damaged forever. He said this, get this, you don't have to write it down, but he said this to Kennedy in 1962. He said, and this is a quote, he said, Mr. President, if we commit now to Vietnam, if we commit now, in five years, we will have 300,000 men in Vietnam. And Kennedy was sitting on the other side of the, side of the table, and he laughed, and he said, George, you're as crazy as hell. And the whole cabinet laughed. And guess what? By 1966, we had 300,000 men in Vietnam, and 200 of them were being killed a week. Well, so Kennedy weighed all of this, and he was pleased with the assessment of his advisors. And eventually, he will send 16,000 advisors to Vietnam. When he took office, there had been 2,000. Kennedy and his advisors were all World War II vets. They had been part of the United States saving the world. They had witnessed the United States emerge from World War II as a superpower. And they felt, get this down, they felt, Kennedy, there are no limits to our power. If we can beat Nazi Germany, get this down, if we can beat Nazi Germany, this is the point I'm trying to make. I don't want you to know just know we went to Vietnam. I want you to know why we failed in Vietnam. It's not enough to know that we failed in Vietnam without knowing why. They had seen the United States defeat two of the greatest tyrannies, maybe the two greatest tyrannies in all of history. And they came out of that experience with the idea that we could do anything. There were, get this down, there, there were no limits to our power. And that's the major lesson of the Vietnam War that we still have not learned. There are, I don't care how big and bad and powerful you are, as a person or as a nation, there are limits to power. Power is not absolute. We often say that, but power is not absolute. The idea that we can do it all, the idea that we can remake the world in our image, this is the mistake that all imperial powers have made. The British made it before us. Uh, depending on how far back you want to go, talking about Af Afghanistan, about 3,000 years ago, Alexander the Great, the mightiest man in the world, the greatest conqueror in the world and ever seen it, marched into Afghanistan and was destroyed. That's why Afghanistan today, and for the last 3,000 years, has been called the graveyard of empires. The British were destroyed in Afghanistan. The Russians, the end of the Cold War begins when Russia loses a war in Afghanistan. And the United States just recently became the latest Western victim to invade Afghanistan. Uh, because people believe there is no limit to power. And yes, there is. That's the greatest lesson of the Vietnam War that sadly we haven't learned. I think, that's my opinion, there is a limit to power. Well, meanwhile, uh, things continue to deteriorate in South Vietnam. In the end, despite the best efforts of the United States, it was clearly a disaster. Um, and write this down. When we come back tomorrow, we will take up Buddhism. Okay, Buddhism. I'm not going to talk about Buddhism. That's what we'll, Buddhism, though, is a really big part of what happens in Vietnam and what gets the United States into Vietnam with ground combat troops.